This is the Friday, February 2nd, 2018 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now, Ted Seifert. Ted, how are you? Doing great, Paul. Happy Groundhog Day? That's correct. I mean, do you celebrate that? Do you, did you see your shadow this morning? I, I knew immediately that I would see my shadow, and then I shaved. And, and was, then you shave, and it was, it was gone. Good. It was all good. All right. Is that a good movie? Do you like the movie? Oh, of course. One of the favorites. Well, I'm we have... Huge Bill Murray fan. Well, how can you not be living in Chicago? I mean, yeah, sure. He's a native guy. We have a couple of <laughs> questions from our viewers themed with Groundhog Day. Perfect. So we'll get to those right now. But before we get to that, Ted, I have to ask you about the cotton market. We saw the story about cotton uh, in the program. We didn't get a chance to answer it. Uh, I believe December was the most bail since 2014 that were sold. What? But yet the, the market hasn't really reflected that this week. It's been a great run for the last three weeks, four weeks. Yeah, so I mean, we've come off highs. We, we've basically seen a 50% retracement now at this point, um, but we followed that up with uh, marketing your high exports here this week. So we're finding that those exports are really coming to life on a pullback off the highs. That's really good news. Uh, the lower dollar, I think, might be helping out there as well. Um, and overall, you know, I, we've got a quality issue in cotton. Our exports have been really good, so demand is really quite good. There is a good side to the story. Um, however, you're probably going to pick up a fair amount of cotton, cotton acres down in the south as well. Um, so longer term, you, you, you see production respond to higher prices. Uh, and I think that that kind of idea had kind of crept into the market and maybe why we pulled back a little bit. But I'm looking for a bounce here. Uh, I think the, the strong weekly export sales, again, suggesting that global end users are, are really liking the price here. Uh, if, the sale, if the sales can continue, uh, continue to be strong, I think you get a bit of a bounce. Well, cotton is tied to our first question from Dan in Geneseo, Illinois. He says, if there is abandonment in wheat, insert the word cotton if you want to for this discussion, Ted, will that add to corn and soy acres? Well, I think you look at the corn and soybean ratio and it is really asking for more soybean acres. But we saw that again last year. Um, I think there's a good chance we, we look at this corn and soybean ratio and, yeah, might, might see some more soybeans here this year. Uh, but for the most part, I think it means that we hold the higher soybean acres. Uh, overall, I think you do see a little bit more corn acres and a little bit more soybean acres. Uh, the reason why I think uh, you see more corn acres is that while the guys up in the north are almost forced to move more towards soybeans, um, you guys in the I states, you know, you, you look at how well corn yielded last year, new record yield in a year where we had a, a fair amount of adversity. Exactly. So we've just gotten so comfortable with the corn yields now at this point. Uh, that I think, I think corn acres really hold on. And, and honestly, if you look at it, um, we've really built up corn demand very well, you know, with lower prices over the last few years. Uh, we need, we really do need 90, 91, 92 million acres of corn. <laughs> There's people that argue with that. No, I know. Uh, but do you see wheat acres or cotton acres then going away in favor of corn or soybeans to fill that void it's, that you're talking about. Wheat is the one that... You think wheat's the loser in that? Yeah, it continues to be. Okay. It, mainly because there's so much competition with everywhere else in the world. All right, well, Kylo's asking another wheat question. This one's very specific, and so <coughs> Market Plus is a great place. If you have a very specific question, we'll try to get to it. He's asking, if it stays mostly dry and Kansas harvests a 30 to 35 bushel to the acre wheat crop, what's the top end mm. for Kansas City wheat? 30 to 35, that's pretty aggressive. Especially um, when you have... Uh, 44% poor, very poor. 47% of the crop is in drought status. Yeah, sure. But there's still time for some of that to come back around. Sure. Uh, it, the very poor category, you look at that and you figure there's damage done. But you look at the poor, anything from poor and fair, I think, can have a chance to come back. Uh, that's a really aggressive cut to yield. It's not, un, it's not impossible. Um, but, you know, we'll see. That being said, if, if that were, let's call it 35 national average yield, uh, 550. Uh -huh. um, okay. I'm not sure we can hold above that, though, and if we get there, I think that's a great sell. Uh, Absolutely, considering what we've seen. Yeah. Yeah, uh, all right. Uh, Flinton in Zambroda, Minnesota, there by Rochester. He's asking again about weather. La Nina this year? Mm -hmm. Does that mean lower than trend corn yield? And then he asked, follow up, how high can corn go? I kind of pinned you down on the yep. program a little bit. La Nina, do you think that's really taken effect? Well, the current forecast models are for a warmer, drier growing season, but in a lot of places, we saw that already last year and still ended up with a national average yield. I think the big question for corn nowadays is how do we look going into the growing season? If we have good subsoil moisture like we did last year and we have a good August like we did last year, we're going to have national average or record national average yields. So 
the next couple of months, um, you know, as we get into planting, how are we going to look? It, what's, what's the soil uh, profile look like going into that? Um, that's the bigger question, I think. So, yeah, uh, a lot. some of the, uh, the models are suggesting we could have a warmer, drier summer. It could be very similar to what we saw last year, um, but we had national average yield records last year. So, again, subsoil moisture going in. But we're still in early February, so right. there's still a lot, a lot of, of time. ways to go. Uh, William in Hiawatha, Kansas. He's at WTMCC on Twitter, and you're at the Ted Spread on Twitter, by the way. Can we get 375 for corn and $10 cash corn and, for, and beans for new crop? We're pushing $10 already on new crop beans. We're close. Well, so he's asking cash, right? Oh, he's asking cash, sorry. And where where did word. you say he was again? Uh, in Kansas, okay. Hiawatha. Um, not exactly sure what basis is doing right there, but uh, let's say this. Um, yeah, I mean, we're not far off those numbers unless your basis is really terrible. Uh, I think there's a good chance that we see some of those things, you know, just in a normal summer rally, June rally, if there's any sort of problems there. Um, the problem I have is soybeans, again, you know. Uh, I'm worried that there's going to be a, we're going to have a really hard time moving this year's crop because of the quality concerns. And if we've got a lot of soybeans left over from this year and we're planting extra acreage next year, it's going to take a lot of a, a major weather problem to really get us to where we need to go to get to the, the better prices you, you want to see. Well, and Drew, in a question, he was asking um, the significant sell-off. You did kind of cover that in the program. You are concerned a little bit long-term here on beans. Yeah, like I said, I mean, uh, everything's kind of pointing to that the soybean crop that we have is of lesser quality than what we've seen in years past. And global end users have really made it uh, somewhat apparent, in China in particular, that because of pro, uh, poor crush margins, they really want to seek out the more premium and the better product soybeans, South American, Brazilian in particular soybeans. They're willing to pay more for it um, because they're getting better margins off of it. So, yeah, I, that is a major concern for me. And, and if we have a hard time moving this soy crop, we either need to see much lower prices in order to incentivize making the sales, uh, or we're going to have a lot of bushels hanging around. All right, we talked about Groundhog Day references. Phil in Dresden, Ontario, Canada. He's at Agrodome on Twitter. Hey, Phil. Hey, Phil. He's asking, December corn is approaching resistance. The last two years, we've had lower highs on December corn. June 2016, July 2017. Is it 6 a.m. again in 2018? You know, yeah. deja vu. Yes. Um, well, uh, Phil, um, you know, last two years, we're in an overall downward trending channel on a weekly and monthly chart, not just the daily chart. Um, and uh, yes, so, you know, we spent a lot of time in the month of December coming up with what, what our target prices are under normal conditions. Uh, for the year. The last two years it had in December corn it was 444, which by the way the market got through it by four and three quarters of a cent. Last year it was 421, the market missed it by two and three quarters of a cent. Um, this year it's 414. Uh, so that number continues, it's flattening out a bit, but that number continues to go lower under normal market conditions. We can do a lot better than that if we have a major weather issue of something of that nature or something happens on the demand side that we're not currently seeing. Um, but if all, if all goes if all goes normally, I mean, if, if we have just a normal growing season, then yes, it very much is 6 a.m. again. All right, well, let's keep asking questions about Groundhog Day. And this one is from Glenn in Bryan, Ohio, at Glenn underscore newcomer. In the, in the movie, we talk about is any, that anything different is good. Can you apply this to the grain markets at this time? Something's different, good or bad. <laughs> yes. Hi, Glenn. Um... I think a lot of us will say that, yes, anything different is good because we had gotten so lulled into very tight ranges and grains that it just nothing was going anywhere. And it was, uh, you know, I, obviously when we see volatility from a producer angle, we, we would like to see it to the upside. And especially when we're down at low prices, uh, we like to see volatility to the upside. But no, I, I think we wanted to see some movement. So something different in this case very much is good. Well, was this one of the more volatile weeks we've had in quite some time yeah, for yeah. the majority of the wow, markets? Wow, you know, we had, we had uh, 10 minute periods where soybeans would trade a 10 cent range. We, we don't, that doesn't, that hasn't happened for a while. Yeah. Um, for corn to be, uh, uh, have more than a, a, a four or five cent move uh, or more than a two or three cent move in a week, 
uh, is pretty impressive, especially since we did it to the upside. So, yeah, I, I'd say there's some volatility coming back into the markets. All right. Well, let's... Uh this one's really in the weeds, but Hair Farmer in uh, Groton, South Dakota. That's his name this week on Twitter, <laughs> at Shilky Corn. For an already awesome. well-hedged 2018 soybean producer who wants to protect up to and past APH, which option strategies do you like? He wants to say he's throwing you a softball. Yes, well, because he knows that uh, by puts. <laughs> 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 no, right. So, um, you know, in soybeans, you never want to oversell. Uh, because that is a, always an explosive market. Something can happen, and we can see soybeans rally $2 just out of the blue. Uh, Brazil rains continue to linger, and that quality of that crop to, to, uh, deteriorates quickly. And so, um, yeah, I, I think you got to look at puts and put spreads. Now, was he talking about old crop or new crop? He didn't say. Just, okay. just well, no, well hedged 2018 soybean producer. Okay, right. So new. So if you're already well hedged and you want to get shorter, I'd be hesitant to do with futures, although, you know, by all means, use a stop and just, you know, keep it tight. Um, but, you know, if you don't want to, if you don't want to put that much work watching it, you know, like a hawk, uh, you know, owning puts is not a bad thing to do. Okay. Um, we try not to get too political on the show, but sure. there, the issue, uh, Jenny in Marion, Iowa, is asking if there's anything that grain marketers should do now to pro actively, proactively plan for changes to NAFTA. Mm. This is one where I've had the analysts sit in the chair and I've asked them, what way do they see? Some see no difference, but is there something a producer can do to look ahead if something were, were to change? Well, obviously, if we're concerned about changes to, the NAFTA, to NAFTA, we're concerned about changes that aren't, aren't in our favor as far as you know, grain exports are concerned, uh, or cattle and hog exports too. Uh, so, you know, I mean, always looking at an eye, uh, keeping an eye on the downside and, and having maybe a little bit more protected or hedged uh, than maybe you would, knowing that you have this other conflict or other potential uh, big negative factor out there. Um, that being said, I don't think we're going to see any movement into the markets until after something actually happens. And sure. if something actually happens, um, I'd almost rather be more reactionary to it. Because I do kind of feel like there's a good chance that we're going to see NAFTA not only hang around, but end up being really a pretty decent deal for us. So I'm not, it's not something that's at the forefront of my mind. I could be terribly wrong, and we'll see. But um, I'm not putting on NAFTA hedges here sure. at, at this point. Okay. All right. Uh, we are really long on time, so I have to be really, really quick with this. Baloo wants to know if Ted had to pick his top five bands and their best hits from the 90s, because... Ted and I have discussed music and his music career on the MTOM podcast, if you want to find this conversation and why this gets asked. So real quickly, oh, wow. five bands. Gosh, five bands and their best hits. Well, um, well let's, let's just stick I think to he, bands. He, we can put he references Presidents of the United States of America, which was one of my favorite bands yes. in the 90s. Although, as much as I like Peaches, I think Kitty is a very good song, too. Um, wow, I was really obviously into Pearl Jam, um, uh, Alice in Chains. You know, I, we can run down the list. Uh, Foo Fighters is what we were discussing. Before we were talking we about Foo Fighters, Nirvana, Dave here. Grohl. You know, yeah. the whole yeah, the whole grunge alt. Um, yeah, I was big into that, I suppose. But uh, Spin well, Doctors. I'm, I'm trying to think. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit on Twitter last <laughs> night too. Uh, so if you want, I'm trying to think of, of some like off the wall one. But President of the United States of America was right. was one of my favorite bands. If you want to see more and interact with Ted when it comes to Twitter or uh, his bands, hit him up on Twitter. Ted, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate you coming. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. That will do it for Market Plus. Join us again next week when we'll explore how urban consumers are getting fresh produce from a different kind of container. And John Roach will sit across from me here at the Market to Market table. So until then, thanks for watching, listening, or reading. I'm Paul Yeager. Have a great week.